Okay, so we'll start to... Good evening, everyone. People are still coming, so, but I have a small introduction, so uh, to not waste the precious time of the Tsumna, we will start a little bit before. Jetsumna Tenzin Palmo, her presence among us is not only for answering questions, but is in itself a blessing, especially in this region of the world, namely the Arab world, about which she herself said that the Dharma is almost absent. However, and we and others are working hard and with the blessings of Jetsunna and with the presence of our doctor and Professor Jagvini to make the Dharma present. And the fruits of our labor began to appear. And the candle of light, when lit, would not be able to be extinguished by all dark. I will quickly and briefly tell two stories about our work. Last June, a faculty of Sharia at some university in Iraq asked me to give a lecture on religious sciences via Zoom. And when I suggested that the topic will be on Buddhism, they totally refused it on the ground that it was a sensitive topic. But today on November 16, we opened the Dominica in the Dominican International University and in Arabic, a master's department for the study of religious sciences in which Buddhism will be taught for Arab students in all the Arab world in a solid academic study, and I will personally teach this topic. And I was chosen to deliver the opening speech, which was attended by a group of students and Christian and Muslim clergy. And I said in this opening speech, and it is already this speech is available in YouTube, this moment, I said, sitting Jetsum Natenzin Palmo. I, I said, my esteemed wise teacher, Tenzin Palmo, the nun and founder of one of the major monasteries in the Tibetan regime, recounts that she was with a number of her Buddhist nuns at an interface conference in Jerusalem. Since the uniform of Buddhist nuns with their red clothes and their shaved heads was not familiar to the inhabitants of the holy city, including Muslims, Christian, Arabs, and Jews, a number of residents of different religions came to ask her and her nuns, from which religion are you? She replied that I am a Buddhist. They said to her, what is Buddhism? It is a new religion? We hadn't heard of it before. She said quite the opposite. Buddhism is one of the oldest religions. Its age is more than 2,500 years. And then they asked her, the question that was perplexing and revolving in their minds. And against what religion is the Buddhism? How surprised they were by her answer when she told them, Buddhism is not against any other religion. And it const constantly seeks peace and harmony among all religions. They say to her, this Buddhist 
religion is strange. And we would like to know more about it. We have never before heard of a religion that is not at least against one other religion. I continue telling after the story, this realistic novel and people and Christian and Muslim priest was listening to me. I said this realistic novel is nothing but an expressive picture of the lofty mentality that we had, we have inherited and we are still a victim of it. Our religious affili affiliation is often in opposition to, to and against the affiliation of the different other. Today, I said, I am pleased to announce with confidence that we inaugurate the Master in Religious Studies and Comparative Religions at the Arab Department of the University. We light a candle in the dark tunnel. No matter, no matter how dark the darkness is, it will not be able to extinguish the light of a candle. It is a candle of knowledge that is destined to spread, it is better for a person to light a candle of knowledge than to curse the light of darkness, says the famous Arab proverb. This is what I invite you, I tell, and uh, uh, fi finally in my speech, this is what I invite you to repeat and to apply for students and all present. The attendees, Christian and Muslim clergymen and students listening, listened carefully and politely to what I, I recounted from Jetsunna Tenzin Palma. Yes, Buddhism has a word to say and a message of peace and love that it conveys in this region of the world that is still floundering in a sea of darkness. Jetsunna Tenzin Palmo, welcome for our fifth interview. Before starting our questions, do you have some short message for Arab world and also for this small Sangha led by our professor Jagvin in this Arab world? We are working hardly, but we are happy with you. Well, I'm very, I'm very grateful to you for all the efforts you are making to create more harmony and more understanding between all the various religions of the world. After all, the religions of the world should be the ones who are showing us how to bring out our basic goodness. And why are they not doing that? And because all religions tell us we must be good, we must be kind, we must help others, that all beings wish for happiness, they don't wish to suffer, just as I would rather be happy than miserable, you would rather be happy than miserable, everybody would rather be happy than miserable. So why are we creating misery for people when we know that they would rather be happy? And so, you know, if we just keep to the basics of whatever our religious faith is. And remember that it's always based on love and kindness and, and helping others, you know, being kind to your neighbors, not hurting your neighbors, right? Mm. And do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I mean, everybody knows this. So why are we not doing it? That's the question. Religion should be leading people in the right direction and not creating, being the causes of more problems. They should be the ones that are solving the world's problems. So they should stand up for what their, their founders taught them. That's the point. I sometimes think if Jesus and Muhammad and the Buddha were all up there looking down, they would be betting whose religion has gone furthest 
from what they were trying to tell people, you know, because honestly, their, their message was so clear. Mm. So how is it that we have misunderstood and we have gone so astray? So really, everybody should learn how to live in, in with respect to each other in harmony. As human beings, you know, you would think we could manage that much. So yes, come on, you know, listen to what your, your, your founders told you and, and bring that into reality, you know, that you care for all beings and you recognize that, you know, if religion doesn't teach us the truth, who, where will we learn it, right? So yes. Jetsumna, uh, really this story was uh, very significant and students and also uh, a clergyman was listening carefully because in fact, maybe we are educated in, uh, in uh, our religion to be against another one. That's why I am telling Buddhism had something to say in this uh, region of, uh, of the world and has some uh, maybe also uh, message of love, message of uh, accepting other, which is, it should be more and more uh, uh, evolu uh, evolving in, in this region. Of course, of course. And uh, I mean, it's, I find it very sad that, you know, that the, the religious leaders who should be the ones to really, you know, show us the light are often the ones who are actually, you know, waving the sword and the guns. And that is not how it's meant to be. You know, our, our initial, our innate goodness, that's what they should be teaching people, you know, about our, our, our genuine inner goodness, our good nature, our, our basic nature is good. And the, why are they not helping by setting the example for others to follow, you know, the right example. Yeah, and that's why Jetsubna, we want you to be always with us because it is a, a new and small Sangha but when you are leading this Sangha, it, it will have more encouragement to, to go on in, in this really dark uh, people and dark also period of the history. Well, you know, nowadays there's a lot out there. I mean, uh, you know, on, on the internet, many, many teachers, many, many, um, good things happening, many instruction on how to live a meaningful life. So in that way, in fact, you know, this whole pandemic has been quite extraordinary because it's got all the teachers uh, coming online who previously mm. had never done so. Mm. So there's an enormous wealth of, of spiritual teaching out there now. Mm. that people can easily download, as you were saying, you know, so much is already on YouTube and in podcasts and in all sorts of ways. You know, it's there now. It's there. Yeah, I know it is very well, but with you, your attention is a real blessing. That's all what I want to, to say. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll start our... Uh, questions. Uh, Jetsumna, you say about your long retreat in the cave. One thing I can tell you is that I am never, I am never be bored in page 198. My question, so what can we do to chase away the boredom that we are victims of either in our daily life or in our spiritual life? Well, I mean, one way to clear up boredom, I think, is to pay attention. You know, so often we do things mindlessly again and again, just out of habit without giving them any attention. So then we begin, you know, we find it boring. 
but if we brought more mindfulness, even to very simple tasks, you know, which we normally would regard as being very boring, then if we give them our full attention to what we are doing, it ceases to be boring, actually. It becomes very interesting. And then we can also, if you're, you know, if you're habitually bored, then I would say just relax into that boredom and watch it, you know, observe it. What does it feel like? How is it? How is the mind? You know, so then we begin to get interested in what's going on inside ourselves, you know, by paying attention. Because often we are just bored because we, we just get into a kind of dull state of just doing things and not being interested. So if we pay attention, then things become much more interesting. And also in itself, boredom is not a bad thing, you know, I mean, we can, you know, I mean, sometimes if we're bored, so what, we're bored, you know, you can accept it. But if in our spiritual practice, we are always bored, you know, we just, this again, then maybe we need to um, change our practice for a while do something new and different, which will catch our attention. Because it's all about being aware of what's going on, you know? Normally we are not aware, and that's why we get bored. Sometimes we are bored because all with same thing, same thing, in, so we don't feel some real evolution, some real progress, and all with this agitation of mind, uh, and we cannot uh, go beyond it. That's why maybe we- That's why you've got to be attentive. That's why you've got to bring all your attention, your, all your awareness to what you're doing, what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, we get bored because we, we are not paying attention, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but uh, this is the major problem because attention also needs some, maybe concentration, something, uh, and uh, we feel that uh now spontaneously we lose attention yeah so this is where we need to start training ourselves you know i mean the whole point of learning how to be more aware more mindful and learning you know how to meditate properly is to help the mind to become more focused i mean we get bored because we're unfocused hmm. So by practice, so we're not doing that, you know, you're doing some ordinary um, business, which you you do every time and you're so, you know, it's so routine, so habituated. So bring your attention to what you're doing. Look at your, what's your body, what's your mind, bring, bring yourself into the present. Then it's not boring anymore. You think uh, uh, by only by practice, we can progress in attention? Of course, that's what it's all about. Hmm. I mean, you know, as they say, practice makes perfect. Hmm. So if you don't practice, then you won't get anywhere. But if you keep practicing, trying, bringing your attention back again and again, with joy, you know, hmm. with interest, hmm. then the mind that learns that habit, Instead of the habit of being mindless, mm -hmm. we we'll get the habit of being mindful. Mm -hmm. Then things are not boring mm -hmm. because every moment is new. Mm -hmm. You know, we think that every moment's the same as the previous moment, but that's not true. Every mo if we pay attention, every moment is fresh. Okay, but in our practice, sometimes. Uh, it, uh, and you have a long periods where we feel that uh, attention is, is less or it is same, we don't progress in attention. That's why maybe we are, uh, we have no courage to, to go on. We see, we feel that everything is same agitation, same agitation and- But it's not, you see, this is, this is where we make the mistake. And it's, it's because we're not paying attention. If we paid, if we were more present in the moment, then we would see that every moment is new. 
-hmm. it's not the same it's the same only because our mind is dull mm -hmm. it's not clear okay. and sharp mm -hmm. so the problem is always not what's happening out there the problem is what's happening in our mind okay you, you talk uh, many times, Jetsunna, on breathing and the breathing of the vase is often, you say, uh, is often cited uh, in your uh, speeches, but there are different variations. What do you think is uh, its main form and which variants are useful to practice? Can it be taken as a standard breeze in uh, long-term uh, practice? Does this vase breeze correspond to the advice to push energy towards the hara on the exhale in Zen meditation? Well, in a vase breathing or kumbhaka, as it's called in, in, in Sanskrit, I mean, the, 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 it's a method to activate the prana or the you know subtle breath by re retention of the breath in the abdomen so the abdomen swells out and it looks like a vase so it's called mm -hmm. vase breathing but you know honestly and truthfully it, we should be careful because if we do it wrong we can cause a lot of problems for ourselves mm -hmm. mentally and physically mm -hmm. and so i would not advise anyone to do it without getting expert um, instruction from a teacher on how to do it properly. Because if you do it wrong, you can really upset the energies in the body. Mm. And it, if you get an imbalance of the prana, it can cause a lot of problems. We should obviously be guided by a teacher when practicing it? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if we do it wrong, it can create a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Mostly in pranayama. So at the beginning, you need to and see if you're doing it right, you know? Mm -hmm. Mostly in pranayama, there is many exercises which are so delicate to, to practice. Oh, yeah. And traditionally, you always did that with, you know, you would have a guru who would teach you and yeah. watch you mm -hmm. to make sure you're doing it right, you know? Mm -hmm. Nowadays, everybody learns off Google or something, but it's not the same. Yeah, yeah, right? and they watch uh, Google, or they watch uh, mostly also uh, YouTube, some exercises on YouTube, and they do. And uh, many times, maybe they can do it wrongly without any checking to their practice. I would be careful. I would say be careful. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, Jetsumna, with the popularity of mindfulness these days. We often hear people say that they don't need to practice formal meditation because they practice mindfulness in daily life. Most of the time, it seems that they are deceiving themselves. What explanations would you give them to help them find a balance between formal practice and practice between sessions? Well, you know, basically, um, our, our practice between the sessions, learning how to be mindful between sessions depends on the depth of our formal sitting meditations, right? So it's important to maintain this balance between formal sitting and daily mindfulness. Mm. So usually a, a period of formal sitting without distraction leads to much deeper levels you know you're not you're not just mindful of actions but here you're just sitting the body is still there's only the mind mm. and so in, in formal meditation you're just sitting there uh, with the mind only looking mm. and so that allows for deeper and deeper exploration of our consciousness because we don't have the distraction of every day movement and dealing with uh, events outside of ourselves. So therefore, that's why retreat centers, you know, they teach um, insight and Vipassana and Shamatha, all these meditation techniques, as well as mm. mindfulness. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. right they never say you can just go off and and just try to be mindful during the day you don't need to also do formal sitting you also don't need to do retreats they teach both mm. you know because okay. one sustains the other mm. if you have no mindfulness in daily life then when you're in retreat and you leave retreat everything falls apart right mm. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people think oh what was the use of that so you need to have that maintenance of the mindfulness, but the mindfulness is deepened and strengthened through the formal sittings and the retreats. So the two of them go together. They, they, mm -hmm. they sustain each other. Okay. We, we should practice both and uh, continue yes, with both. Def definitely. Because one without the other doesn't, will not, uh, bring any really deep insight or transform the mind. The mm. point is we're trying to transform our consciousness. And, uh, you know, for that, you need steady application, but you also need periods of um, just completely being at one with the consciousness and not, um, you know, during daily life, both. Okay. Jetsuna in a number of spiritual movements and even in established religions, there is a clear impression that the hierarchy and the teachers are trying to infantilize the believers. This is certainly not con uh, conducive, conducive to spiritual maturity. Is, it, is this also your feeling? If so, how can we get out of this rut and how can we distinguish between this and true spiritual childhood, which is equality? Well, I mean, first of all, any skill that we wish to learn, any sport or music or any skill, we need a guide, we need a teacher, because there, a teacher can show us where we're going wrong, and show us how to do things properly. If we just try to do it on our own, we are bound to make lots of mistakes and we won't know their mistakes, right? We won't understand. So even in the most mundane things like learning how to play football, you need to have um, a, a teacher, you know, you need to have someone who helps you. So therefore also when we are on the spiritual path, to begin with, we are like children. We, we are not very mature. The Buddha called ordinary people the childish. Mm. And so therefore, at that time, we need guidance, just as a child needs the parents, right? Mm. But a good parent mm. is bringing up their children to be responsible adults. Mm. A bad parent is bringing up the children to always be dependent on themselves and needing mommy and daddy to help them the whole time through, even when they're grown up. But a good parent teaches the children to be independent and responsible. Likewise, a good guru is teaching their students to be inwardly mature and independent so that although they will always have devotion for their guru, just as children always will love their parents, they don't keep running to them every moment. I mean, a guru who needs his students to always be his students forever is obviously has problems. Mm. And a, a genuine uh, guru is teaching the, their students to be, become inwardly spiritually mature and uh, independent of their, their, you know, their reliance on the guru, even though they maintain their devotion to the guru. Mm. So, I mean, the problem is not the system. We need instruction. I don't know how to meditate. I need someone to help me to meditate. I need someone to point out when I'm making mm. mistakes. I need someone to encourage me. And our openness to a genuine guru, you, through your openness, you, you get the blessings for mm. the mind, right? That's mm. one of the, the important things is that through our openness towards the teacher with our devotion, then it's like sunlight. You know, if you open up the, the, the curtains, the, the sun will come in. If you close the curtains, there's no, the, the room will stay dark. 
But nonetheless, as we say, you know, I mean, a, a genuine guru at a certain point expects the students themselves to become teachers even, you know, at least they expect them to, um, you know, not every moment rely on them, but to be, have their own independence. So the problem is only with bad gurus, not with good gurus. The problem is not the guru situation. The problem is how it's exploited by those who need to have, you know, students and devotion and, and surrender and um, for their own psychological needs, which is not the right kind of teacher to follow. Look at their students, you know, in 10, 20 years, what kind of, what kind of um, atmosphere do they have around them? Are the students still running to the guru every minute, you know, for their decisions or are the, the students and themselves um, poised and able to make their own decisions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mostly, and even uh, Swami Vijayananda said, all with yoga is not a worship of gurus, but in fact, we, we see and we watch a lot of worship of gurus around the world. And uh, what, how, well, what do you say about this phenomena? Well, I mean, worship of gurus means what? I mean, if you have a, a teacher who truly exemplifies all the, the qualities which uh, you yourself are striving to achieve, then of course you, you have great devotion to them. But it, I mean, it doesn't mean that therefore you blindly have devotion. I mean, you can also see that this, although they have so many qualities, they're also human beings. And the problem only comes when, you know, the, the worship is blind and it becomes a cult. Mm. Then, then it is very dangerous. But genuine teachers aren't, don't create cults. Uh, they are, you know, very, very, their, their relationship also with their student is much more uh, easy, an easy one, not that they demand total surrender and blind faith. Those that demand like that, I, I would be very, very, very suspicious of. What about your own uh, relation with your guru when you was in the cave and also far from uh, your guru, what it was your experience? It was still, you are in, in link with him? Yeah, I mean, usually I would go every year to see him and um, tell him how I was getting on. But in any case, I mean, it's really true that if you have devotion to the Lama or the teacher, then they are there anytime you need them. It's not a matter of distance as far as physical distance is concerned. If your mind is open to them, their mind is open to you. So um, it's, it's, you know, physical, um, you know, separation is not the point. I mean, you can be sitting in front of somebody and you could be a thousand miles away or you could be a thousand miles away. And if you have genuine openness and devotion, then you are, they're as close to you as the beating of your heart. So really? this is why teachers are so, a genuine teacher is very important. But my Lama himself, you know, towards the end, when I would say to him, Rinpoche, what shall I do now? He would say, well, what do you want to do? And then, you know, I would tell him what I thought I'd like to do. And then, you know, he'd either say, oh yeah, that's really good, do that. Or else you really want to do that? Hmm. You know, <laughs> I would assume that wasn't such a good idea. You know? But um, certainly he expected me to, at a certain point, be able to take the reins of my own, um, you know, what I wanted to do, what practices I, I was attracted towards. You still uh, feel some link uh, with him after his departure, Jitsumna? Well, of course, in the Tibetan tradition, they come back again. So now the new come to Rinpoche uh, is, must be, where are we? He must be now, now he's 41. Hmm. And he's the Lama for our nunnery. And he lives in the, uh, the monastery, which is down the road from us. 
So I have known him since he was two years old. Mm. So it's, you know, in the Tibetan system, they, yeah. you know, when the Lama dies and they, they quickly mm. find their new incarnation. Mm. So uh, your relation with this new one is the same than the relation with your first Rinpoche? Not really, because um, the first Rinpoche, I met him when I was, well, on my 21st birthday, and he was much, he was older than me. Hmm. So it was almost like a father figure. I mean, he wasn't that much older, but to me, he was like, you know, hmm. like, if you I... know, authority. Hmm. Whereas the present one, it was, I have known him since he was a, a baby. Hmm. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I was much older and he was just a child. Yeah. So my relationship, therefore, it has been very different. But he's very good Lama. I mean, I, I have no complaints about him. He's he's been, you know, um, he's no he's no trouble. Mm -hmm. And he had the same teacher. It's, it's, it's the same teaching than uh, the uh, your first. Uh, uh, no, well, you know that. I mean, every incarnation is different. Then they're, they're, they're not like you know, right. just um, you know, each one has their own personality and has qualities of the other one, but also is different. So you know, he by by the time I met with this new one, when you know, when he was young, I had already established my practice, so I didn't need to go to him for teaching. And also we had many yogis who were our teachers in those days. Mm. But he's there, I mean, uh, as a spiritual guide for our nuns. And, mm. you know, of course not now because everybody's in lockdown, mm. but normally whenever we would ask him to come to give empowerments or to give teachings, he would always be very happy to come. Mm -hmm. And so for the nuns here, especially, he's their root teacher. Mm. Jetsuna you say about channeling energy, all great saints were passionate people. The, the crucial point is that they did not dissipate their patience in negative ways. Page 233. My question, how do we dissipate our energy in negative ways and how do we avoid this loss? Okay, so our minds are often um, habituated to very poisonous emotions like greed and desire, anger and aversion, jealousy, pride, all these, and especially our inherent, you know, unknowing, our ignorance, right? So therefore, we normally give in to our desires and our greed. We see something we like or someone we like and we reach out and we want them. You know, we want, mm. we're with even food or anything, you know, we, we are very giving or something annoys us, people annoy us, situations annoy us, we get angry. And, and all this uses up a lot of emotion and a lot of energy, which we put into very negative things. You know, we get jealous, we get arrogant, all sorts of, turmoil in our minds, right? So therefore, normally, when these feelings come up, like our greed or our anger, we're not even aware, you know, that, that, that we're overtaken by these emotions. We just get swept along by them, right? So, and that, how our mind is working, how these negative emotions, they, they very much influence our speech, and our actions, right? So we say bad things, we do bad things based on these negative emotions in the mind, right? So someone who is spiritually advanced, right, does not dissipate their energies with these negative, with these negative emotions, right? They turn, for example, desire and greed becomes devotion. Mm. and anger becomes forbearance or compassion you know we work with 
these negative emotions, we recognize them. That's I'm angry, I'm greedy, mm. I'm jealous. And then we transform that, you know, seeing that that negative emotion, recognizing that's going to cause a lot of trouble. Mm. We change it. You know, we're in charge of the mind. We are the masters of the mind. It's the slaves of the mind. This is when, you know, genuine spiritual people, you can see mm. they are not overcome by negative emotions like ordinary people because they're masters of their own, uh, their, their own mental processes, right? Mm. So then the energy is still there, mm. right? The energy is there. It's not like they're all like sheep. You mm. know, the energy is there. They're not rabbits. But that energy is channeled into higher frequency, right? It doesn't go down. It doesn't get dissipated. So first we have to become aware. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to become aware of these. What is happening in the mind at each moment, right? When anger, when greed, when pride or anything comes up, we recognize that, mm -hmm. right? And so then we know what to avoid, which are these negative emotions, and what to encourage and adopt, which are positive emotions, right? Mm. And so then we just practice transforming our negative emotions into positive emotions. It's not that we don't have emotions, mm. right? Yeah. But we don't need to give in to negative emotions. We can use that, that energy. Mm and turn it into positive channels. So when you meet great masters, you can see they're, so, they're more alive mm. than ordinary people, mm -hmm. right? Yes. They're, they're, not, they're not blank, right? Mm. They have tremendous, but what their emotions are, are love, compassion, kindness, generosity, good humor, mm. their eyes sparkling, Mm. You know, I mean, when we meet great masters of, of any tradition, you know, mm. I mean, not just Buddhists, Hindus, mm. Sufis, mm. Um, Christian masters, any masters, you see, it's all in their eyes. Mm -hmm. Their eyes are shining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jetsuna, you say about your life as a woman, you say hormones have never been an obstacle for me. My periods have never bothered me. And I think people make a, a one minute. A minute. Okay, so I, uh, my periods have never bothered me, and I think people make a big deal out of menopause and PMS. Also, I have noticed that men are more moody than women, page 192. My question, the general impression is just the opposite of what you say. A woman during her menstruation is impure. She is not even allowed to pray or perform any rites, etc. Her menstruation causes her to have many mood swings, unlike the male physiology, which is more stable. What they say. What do you think about this? I think that is total male prejudice. The boys <laughs> wrote the books, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of women being impure during menstruation, that's just, just the, the way the men want to make the women feel inferior, right? Mm. By telling them they're impure. I mean, in fact, if there was no menstruation, there would be no people, right? Mm. Because that's part of the, the cycle for women in order to give birth. Mm. I've often thought that if men, if it were the men who had to deal with having periods every month, then they would consider themselves very heroic, mm. you know, and their great strength and fortitude that they're able to bear this every month. And of course, women wouldn't be able to do this because they're too weak. Mm. We men, we're the ones who could do it, you know? Mm. 
if that was men do having periods, that's how they would treat it. Like it was something special, right? Mm. And they were great heroes to bear it. So actually, I mean, we have a hundred nuns, more than a hundred nuns. We have about 120 nuns who perform all their rituals and attend all their philosophy classes without any complaint or any fuss. There's no question of whether they're having periods or not. Nobody cares, mm. right? They mm. just carry on the same as always. They're not considered impure and they don't even think about it, you know? And I've never noticed that they have any particular mood swings. They just carry on cheerfully as usual. And uh, some of them now, they're beginning to go into their, uh, maybe they're about 50 years old, a few mm. of them. So they must be going through menopause, mm. but that doesn't seem to affect them emotionally. They don't even know that they're supposed to affect them emotionally. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they've not been told that. I mean, well, I remember when I was at school, nobody ever thought about it. You just, you know, carried on as usual. You didn't know you were supposed to be emotionally delicate at that time. And so, I mean, I think it's just very fashionable to um, discuss all these hormonal changes. So therefore, you know, of course some people do, but I, I would suggest the majority of them never do. I mean, you know, as I say, here I am surrounded by all these young women who must be having periods constantly, but they do so discreetly and they don't make any fuss at all. And as I say, they carry on with everything, including all their rituals and their meditations and their studies and debating and everything. And nobody makes any fuss. In Buddhism, there is no restrictions for a woman when she is in period for ritual, etc. like Hinduism? Not at all, not at all. Mm -hmm. God in Hinduism, also in Islam, in Judaism, they, uh, so I think it's an Abrahamic thing. So all the Abrahamic religions, especially Judaism and Islam, mm. have this idea of impurity and maybe also in Hinduism, mm. which got influenced by Islam. Mm -hmm. But um, in Buddhism, there, there's nothing about it at all. Mm -hmm. The only thing in the monastic rules about periods is that women during that time are allowed to wear extra garments mm. and that's all it says about it nothing else the, so she can do all rituals without any restrictions even nothing nothing they're not considered to be uh, in any way impure they just carry on as usual yeah it's uh, something new for me even because all with most the other religion there are so restrictive in this field and in this period and no, even they no. that's why no, for this... example even in christianity a woman cannot be a priest because they said when she had her menstruation she is unpure so how she can go in the hotel and... yeah well that they got from judaism you know and and so the abrahamic religions all have certain things in common mm. right um, but even in Hinduism, uh, you can see it in Hinduism also. Yes, but I think the Hindus probably got it from Islam. Mm. Mm. I mean, for example, I mean, nothing about periods, but um, in Buddhism, you when you go into a temple yes. or when you're listening to the Dharma teaching, mm. you should keep your head uncovered, mm. right? Yes. If you cover your head, you are not allowed to teach Dharma to people who have their heads covered, mm. right? Uh -huh. and obviously, that's because at that time in India, mm. to uh, keep your head uncovered was a sign of respect. Mm. But nowadays, even in Hindu temples, women cover their, themselves. And that they got from Islam. Mm. Because in the Abrahamic religions, again, you keep your head covered, right? Mm. And in Christianity, you used to have to wear a hat to go to church. Yeah. Okay. But in, in, the, in Hinduism and Buddhism originally, then it was the opposite. 
Mm. You know, I mean, if I have my head covered, then if I go into a temple, I have to take it off. Yeah. It's the mm. opposite of uh, what yeah. it is in Abraham, yeah. especially Islam. I mean, the, yeah. So in the, obviously in the Middle East, it was the um, custom to keep your head covered. For some reason in India, uh, it was a custom to uncover. Mm. So it's all custom. Yeah. You think it's just a custom? It's not. It not. It don't have some uh, inspiring uh, rules or. Well, I mean, you know, if you cover your head, you have your reasons. If you uncover your head, you have your reasons. But <laughs> it, you know, the the you know, it's both sides are respect, right? And uh, why in Buddhism, uh, monks and nuns they ch shave the the head? Oh, because uh, for one thing, people, uh, you know, are very pr proud of their hair. You know, it's a sign of beauty. Mm. You know, your hair, you know, uh, and that's, that's why uh, they cover, especially in Islam, women, they cover because it's a sign of beauty. So mm. to not attract men, they impose to cover. So, I mean, therefore, um, you know, to shave your head is, is uh, to remove the beauty. Also, it's much more practical. Mm. You know, I mean, if you're always having to wash your hair and, and, and keep it clean, it's, a, it's a, a big nuisance, especially if you're on the road. And also people, when they see you shaving the head, they know you're a monk or a nun. Yeah, right? yeah. I remember uh, even my, uh, uh, in the university, my dean, when he saw me, he said, oh, you become a Buddhist uh, monk. <laughs> Why you have, uh, but uh, you're uh, shaving head. But uh, is it only because people, they said, maybe we cannot understand, we can understand for a man to shave head. But for a woman, it is a little bit hard to, to understand it. Oh, but it's beautiful because you see these girls come, they have long, long, beautiful hair. And, you know, then they, it's all cut and shaved off and they're, they're, they're smiling. They're so happy, you know, because it's a renunciation. Mm. You it's know, I mean, it's become a nun is it, to renounce the world. You have to wear, you know, unflattering clothing and you lose your, your beauty by uh, having, I mean, often they look better with a shaven head actually, because then you can see their face. But the idea is renunciation. Yeah, even in Hinduism, when uh, they take, they took uh, sannyasi, they shave their head, but after <laughs> they let it go on, they don't shave it permanently, only when they take sannyasi. As a yeah, well, some do. Some keep their head shaved and others don't. I mean, it depends on their, um, you know, their lineage. Mm. Mm. So, but it's very practical. You don't have mm. to think about it. You don't have to buy shampoo. Yeah. You don't have to, <laughs> it is my case know. also. I like to shave my uh, uh, head. Uh, so it is, I have not to every day uh, do something for it. It is very, and even I remember uh, my master was saying when he, he said, I shave my hair to not look to the mirror every day and to go on on this illusion that I am this face and I am this, uh, this identification with the face. It will be lost. Well, it's, it's a very practical thing. And as I say, it's... Um... You know, even when you get like lots of nuns together from different traditions, mm. you know, from different countries, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Taiwan, China, Japan, they're all wearing different robes, mm. right? Depending on the, the country they come yeah. from, different colors, white, yellow, mm. pink, gray, black, brown, maroon. Mm. But the one thing we all have in common mm. shave is our shape. Achha. And we can all recognize each other immediately mm. because we have the same hairstyle. Mm. <laughs>
Ijet Sumna, in the same context of uh, men and women, you say the difference between men and women is external, but inside the heart is the same. What is enlightenment, you say, but the knowledge of the heart, page 194. My question, don't the anatomical and physiological differences between the two sexes have a decisive influence on the level of spiritual evolution? Well, you know, I mean, the basic practice, when you're sitting and meditating, you're not man, you're not a woman, really. You know, at that point, gender is totally irrelevant. And, and the basic practices, for example, of sitting, watching the breath, or watching the mind, the thoughts, you know, analyzing the thoughts and so forth, Male or female, you know, it's, it's very similar. I don't see that there is a, that much difference. Of course, um, women, uh, meditation teachers, men even, male teachers, have said that women are usually more, um, more at home in the intuitive. Mm -hmm. Men tend to be more analytical and like to go up step by step. Women are able to just jump and fly, you know, they, mm -hmm. they will jump off the cliff side. They mm -hmm. feel they're not threatened by their intuition so much. So in that way, they often say that women are better at meditation than the men. But in, in Tantra, for example, where one sees oneself as a deity, then, you know, male deities or female deities, you can see yourself as Tara, you can see yourself as a Volikiteshvara, one is female, one is male. Men see themselves as Tara, mm -hmm. and women can see themselves as a Valikiteshvara, or they can see themselves as their own gender, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. So they do meditations in which they see themselves as male or female mm -hmm. of, of either gender. Boys can see themselves as males or as females. Go women can see themselves as male or female deities in and so in that way they they interchange i mean they, it's not that boys see themselves only as men male deities mm -hmm. or only as female deities they can do both mm -hmm. you understand what i'm saying yeah yeah so according and to you so um, therefore in general in general women are more in touch with their emotions i think as boys boys are told not to be emotional mm -hmm. you know big boys don't cry type of thing. So men tend to, um, you know, have, have a harder time mm. relating to their emotions. Mm. But I think that's partly training, you know, mm. the way they've been brought up. Girls are allowed to be emotional. Mm. And so women, because also they are intended by nature to be mothers, Mm. Are, are much more in tune with their emotions like loving kindness and compassion and things like this. So that they feel, you know, they, they feel at home with that because they have always, you know, it's part of who they are. I mean, little girls, you know, sort of tend to cuddle their, their toys and boys use them to fight with. Mm. Um, so, you know, in that way, there are differences, but some men are very intuitive and very at home in their emotions. Some women are very uh, distant from their emotions and have very analytical minds. I mean, we cannot make huge assumptions. Hmm. It's just, you know, in general. Yeah, sometimes uh, spiritually and in normal life, we say we see a woman with male uh, qualities and also in opposite, we can see a man with female quality, uh, it's due to what, according to you? Yes. So, you know, in general, you would say that women are more in, uh, in tune with their emotions, but many men are very sensitive and, and you know, uh, compassionate naturally. So, you know, you can't really make generalizations, but in any case, when you're sitting and meditating, I would say you're not male or you're not female. You just are. Mm -hmm. So in, in real uh, meditation state, we are beyond yes. to be male yes. or female? 
Yes. And of course, the nature of the mind, the, the, the non-dual primordial awareness is definitely beyond gender. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's no question of that. It's only, our, our, you know, the, the ordinary conceptual mind, which it relates to a male or, or female body that makes gender. In Nirvana, we and are beyond <laughs> male and female? Be great masters. You would say a great masters are on the whole, not male or female. I don't mean that the, you know, like he's effeminate, mm. but you feel there's something almost female about them also. They're not kind of macho males. Mm. There's a kind of warmth and motherliness almost mm. about, you know, genuine masters. It's like they've, they've brought together the two sides and uh, you know they they have balanced mm -hmm. the the male and female energies. Okay. Uh, Jitsumna, you say the modern scientific approach has given so much importance to the brain that we are completely cut off from this reality of the heart. This is why so many people feel that life is sterile and meaningless, page 175. My question, so how do we reestablish a good connection with the heart on both the social and spiritual levels? Well, I, I think it's very important that we, um, we cultivate uh, those qualities which we associate with the heart, such as um, in, in Buddhism, there's something called the four immeasurables, which is uh, loving kindness and compassion, uh, joy in, in, you know, in good things and um, equanimity. So that, those kind of emotions, if we're, we're cultivating loving kindness and compassion, that brings the attention down into the center of our being. It's, it's not purely cerebral. It, it's, it's a much deeper level which we're mm -hmm. activating. And, and so that's very important for everybody. I mean, for example, in Tonglen, in this um, sending and receiving, we visualize taking in suffering in through the breath down into the center of the heart and then sending out light and love and healing again from the center of the heart through the breath outwards. So you're always centering yourself back into the heart region, the heart chakra, right? Mm. And then also we can visualize the divine by whatever, whatever we think of as the divine and the heart chakra. Mm. You know, so for example, if you have a very close relationship with your, your teacher, your guru, you could see your, your teacher in your heart center, or you could see Jesus, or you could see the Buddha, or you could see whoever, or just light, mm. you know, here at the heart, even during the day, you know, to, to open up the heart and, and stop it from being so close. And then also, you know, when we, we meet with others to wish them well, recognizing that all beings want happiness and don't want suffering, they really would rather feel better than worse. And that, again, that feeling for, of empathy for the suffering of others and wishing their well-being comes from, from a deep level inside us. Hmm. And if we are really meditating and in a deep level of, of meditation, that also slips from the, the, the head down into the center of our being. I mean, our, our real center of our awareness is, is sort of here rather than up in the head. And then, so the head and the heart balance together make us uh, whole. You know, it doesn't mean that we just only emotion. We also have intellect and intelligence, but the two should come together. Mm. You know, our, our natural wisdom, and at the same time, our compassion. Mm -hmm. So we work on it. If, you, if we are not in contact with our positive emotions, then we, we meditate until we are in contact. Mm -hmm. It will come. 
Of course, because that's our nature. Our nature, our true mm. nature, is, mm. is loving kindness and compassion and wisdom. So we are just coming back to who we really are. Mm -hmm. But often people have closed the door, so they can't see it anymore. They're, they're out of you know, contact with their true nature. So we have to recover our true nature, which is compassion, uh, love and compassion and... Uh... And wisdom. Uh -huh. I mean, we're, you know, there, there is this clear seeing of how things really are. Mm -hmm. And the more we see how things really are, the more compassion arises. Mm -hmm. Because we see how completely messed up we are, <laughs> how messed up everybody else is. Mm -hmm. and, and so then we feel tremendous compassion for us all. Okay. Jetsumna, uh, you tell a very beautiful, wonderful dream in your book. Uh, the dream with the multi-level uh, multi prison in which all people are in. It is really wonderful, this dream. My question, have you at least got out of this prison? And can we hope to get out of it before the realization? and the end of the cycle of samsara? Well, you know, the prison house of samsara exists for as long as we believe that there is an I or a me who is living in the prison. In other words, the prison house of samsara is the ego, right? Mm. So as long as we are driven by our ego, then we are going to be stuck in the prison, whether we're up in the penthouse or down in the dungeons, we're trapped. We're trapped by our ignorance, mm. right? So the key is wisdom. Mm. The key is to recognize that this small self is what is covering uh, our true nature, which is something quite beyond that. So when the, tr the small self dissolves, right? And we realize our true nature, then there is no more prison house. But that, of course, is, is very difficult. And it's why we practice. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm as trapped in the prison as anybody. Don't think I've escaped. But there are those who have. And that's why they come back to, to show us how to, um, you know, open up the doors. And uh, the whole point of a bodhisattva is that they don't just leave the prison themselves and leave everybody else behind. Their, their vow is to keep coming back until finally the prison house is empty. Jetsumna, this dream, it is a wonderful story. It is your own dream or you get it from some scripture? I just, what I dreamt, I mean, you know. It is wonderful, course, um, I read it, I said, what is, it is much more beautiful than what we read in the scriptures. So, so <laughs> beautiful, so, so inspiring. Well, it's, it's meaningful because it, re it recognizes that whether indeed, whether we're, we're living up in a very wonderful looking, you know, environment, having parties the whole time, or whether we're down in the prison, in the dungeons being tortured, or in between whatever we're doing, we're all trapped. Because, uh, you know, and, when and, I read- But there's a way out. That was the point in the dream, that there is a way out. And it's, you know, that we can escape, but it's, it's not so easy. When I read this uh, story of a dream, I said she should be this nun, a real bodhisattva to, to see such a- well, the whole point that the, the prison has dissolved when one stopped running away for oneself, but was running in order to help others to also escape. As soon as that thought came into the mind, then the dream changed and became a different dream. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the point is to recognize that at this moment we are caught up in this prison house, however nice it may appear or however difficult it may appear. And that it's very insecure and people up can go down, people down can go up. It's always changing. Mm. Jetsuna, you say,
people claim that they have no time to meditate. This is not true. You can meditate while walking in a corridor at a traffic light, while waiting in a queue, etc. But to page 228. In this case, my question, any act one does, can, one does can be a meditation, but that is, a pre, uh, that is precisely what we do not feel. How then can we transfer the banal acts of daily life into a meditation, especially th since these acts are often a source of negative emotions, our acts. Either they make us angry or they make us afraid or they make us sad, etc. How then can we separate these acts from the negative emotions they may cause us. Well, I mean, you know, Lewis, this is the essence of mindfulness practice. This is the essence of learning how to be more aware. In Buddhism, <coughs> sorry, mm. in Buddhism, mindfulness actually means the awareness of what should be avoided, that's negative emotions, and what should be adopted, which is positive emotions, in the mind, right? So when we see a negative emotion, as I said, in the mind, we recognize it immediately. And having accepted this, then we have the opportunity to change it, right? So this is the point. And so therefore we change anger into forbearance, and greed into detachment or to generosity, etc. I mean, the point is to recognize that emotion, that thought and emotion at the moment when it arises. And then also the Buddha taught that we should be learn how to be aware in the four postures of standing, sitting. Uh. Jacques. We're sort of lost. I can't hear you, Jacques. You are hearing me? You're muted. Uh, this moment, you hear me? Oh, here we are. Okay, okay, sorry. We're back. It is the connection of Lebanon. <laughs> so we were talking about... Yes, well, that's, it's amazing we are even connected. Mm. Your internet connection is unstable. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Go on. Sorry. We was talking about Yeah. Uh, you can continue please. You can well, continue we please. Talking about meditation and we well, were talking about meditation and mindfulness. I'm sorry, your, your voice is distorted. Uh, this moment you hear me properly? Yes, yeah, now I can hear you. Okay, yes. you can continue, please. Continue what you were talking about mindfulness and daily meditation. Well, what I'm saying is that, you know, in Buddhism, mindfulness is to observe the, the thoughts 
and mm -hmm. to um, to be able to uh, avoid negative emotions, you know, like mm -hmm. greed and anger when they come up, to recognize them and to transform them. And at the same time to adopt and encourage positive emotions, right? So when we see a negative emotion arising in the mind, like anger or greed or, or jealousy or any of these emotions, then we recognize it immediately. Mm. And we accept that I am angry, right? Or I am greedy, this is mm. greed, right? Mm. And so then when we see it and we accept it, it's not that we suppress it, we, we, we recognize it, we see it, this is what it is, but then we can change it. Mm. So then anger gets changed into forbearance and patience and greed into generosity or contentment and, and so forth like that. And also in physical movements, the Buddha said that during when we're standing or sitting, walking, lying down, we should be aware of that. Mm -hmm. So we can start by taking a simple action like cleaning our teeth, drinking mm -hmm. a cup of tea, and instead of just doing it mindlessly, you know, you're drinking your tea and thinking of something else. Mm -hmm. We give all our attention to that, you know, not thinking about it, but just knowing that action, mm -hmm. you know, how he is, how we feel about it, what the mind is doing, what the body is doing, like mm. this. We, we mm. bring our attention mm. to what is actually happening in the moment instead of always being caught up in the past or in the future or running around in the present. This is the basis for um, learning how to become the master of our mind instead of, as usual, the slaves to whatever our mind is thinking. Hmm. So also a very easy thing is to practice being aware of breathing. Normally hmm. we breathe and we're not aware we're breathing. So when we get agitated during the day, we can just bring the attention to breathing in and breathing out, you know, and hmm. bring the mind into the present because we don't breathe in the past or the future. We only breathe now. Mm -hmm. So if we are conscious of the breath, we're present. And in this way, the mind gets trained because mm -hmm. the mind is, as the Buddha said, you know, a mad monkey. Mm -hmm. And we have to tame the monkey if we want genuine peace and happiness in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, concerning the major issue of celibacy, you say, celibacy remains a, rel a relevant and very important issue. It has a purpose. Not only does it free the body. You hear me? Not only does it free the body, but it clears the mind. It also frees the emotions. Page 245. So, that is why the majority of saints, my question, in all spiritual traditions are mostly celibate and how does celibacy relieve the emotions? Well, you know, obviously to be truly celibate, um, involves the mind, it involves the thoughts and the emotions. It's not enough <coughs> to refrain from sexual activity, but at the same time have, have salacious thoughts. You know, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're, when we're engaged with uh, sex, then of course our, our feelings are also engaged, right? And uh, we, we, there's attraction, there's desire, there's lust. And so we're attached and often um, we get very disturbed emotionally as well as physically. So if we refrain from sexual activity with our whole being, that means with the mind as well as with the body, then that an energy can be channeled into other areas, right? Such as creativity or devotion, meditation, it releases those 
emotions, which are usually caught up in, in, phys, in the physical. And it allows the mind freedom to redirect our energies and our concentration. But on the other hand, some practices also um, make use of the sexual energy, right? And deliberately use the sexual energy to open up the psychic channels and the various chakras. I mean, for example, Kundalini yoga or the Tumo or inner heat body, uh, you know, practices of the Tibetans. Plus, I mean, many masters are married and, and some of them have families. So it's not that sex per se is a good thing or a bad thing. It, it depends how we make use of it. But for ordinary people, um, sometimes at least a period of celibacy can be very helpful for, um, you know, just leaving the mind free to think of something else. Mm -hmm. Even... We can be celibate for a... I can't hear you. You're muted. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you okay. hear me? Uh, uh, even we, we can be celibate for a limit uh, period. I, I can't hear you. Uh, voice is broken. Uh, you hear me this moment? You don't yes. hear me? You hear me? But it, it gets distorted. Ah, yeah, yeah. It is due to the, uh, yes. the connection. This moment is good. You you hear yes. me this moment? Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. My question is that we, so we can be. Uh, celibate for a limit period, for example, not for whole life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for example, when people go into retreats, mm. then they are celibate, right? Mm. Often they're also in silence. Yeah. Uh, some people take a vow of celibacy for a, a certain period of time, like, you know, six months, one year, etc just mm. so that they can use that that time not to get caught up in attraction to this one or that one but to uh, keep their mind uh, focused on on perhaps their spiritual practice or whatever they're doing mm. so it doesn't have to be lifelong okay uh, for example in thailand it is the custom for all men mm. all boys to become monks for mm. a, a certain period, mm. usually a few weeks or a few months or maybe one year. But it's like a, a, um, a transition from being a boy to a man. Mm. You have to have been a monk for a certain amount of time. Mm. Even the king of, of Thailand was a monk for a while. Um, it's, it's part of their tradition to take temporary ordination. Mm. Even in Hinduism, we have it in some ashari, in some period of life, we should uh, be uh, a brahmachari and after we can get marriage. And, uh, and there is many periods uh, different. Sometimes we have to uh, be celibate, other times yeah, it, it is changing. Yes, I think it, it can be very helpful for people, even if only for limited time you know mm. to put their energies towards what they're doing instead of getting um mm. distracted by you know uh, their attraction towards this one or that one mm. keep their mind focused on what they're supposed to be doing in the same context you say I, it, uh, it, uh, you say I'm it, sorry, Grace, your, your voice is really breaking up. Uh, maybe last question. You 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 hear me this moment? And now you're telephone. Uh, 
It's it's Hickman, very distorted. Hmm. I, I think we should give up. For it's already been an hour and a half. I think that's enough now. We can do the, the other questions next time. Uh, this this moment, moment, you hear me? me? Sort of, but I'm really, I'm really quite tired. I mean, mm. it's late night for me. Okay. okay. Uh, and I have, I have... So maybe we call it uh, enough for an evening. Okay. You are hearing this moment? Not hearing. Okay, so what you can do? Uh, uh, this moment, 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 moment. Jack, Jack est-ce que tu m'entends? Bah, tu peux lui poser la question. Tu peux, tu m'entends, Jack? Jacques, ma chambre. Hmm. Chambre. I think we should get up for the night. Okay, okay, as as you like. I think you're muted. You don't hear me. Yes. You don't hear me. It's very distorted. Yeah, yeah, because, because it is raining. Hey, it's cold, but it's storm. Okay, it is this bad connection, what we can do. Uh, Jacques, est-ce que tu m'entends? Jacques, mais je suis pas Jacques, est-ce So, don't mind, Louis. I would just wish you good night, yeah. and we can do the rest of the questions next time with okay. a better connection. Okay. Yeah. Happy New Year. Okay. Happy New Year. Maybe Thank we'll you. see you Thank in you. the next year. Okay. May two thousand twenty-two be auspicious. Thank you so much. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, everybody, all the translators. Thank you very, very much. Till next time. Malek, you enter. He will do much active to build connection. Yeah, that's the one. شو؟ Oh, well, thank you. 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 Thank you.